so I'm going to do that. Hello, everybody. How's it going? If you can hear me, raise your hand. Okay, so we can hear all the way in the back. Terrific. Uh, so happy to see you all live and in person. Um, this is the first live event we've done in now over two years. And so we're really excited. What, do I have to wear this? Do I not have What's the story on this? I have to wear it? Okay. Um, so apparently we have to wear them. Um, but we're so excited to be back in person. Um, my name is Alan Greenlee. I'm the executive director of the Southern California Association of Nonprofit Housing. And as a result, I suppose I'm your host. So thank you guys for coming out. I want to say... Uh, a handful of things. One is uh, save the date. Mark your calendar today, October 27th and 28th. We will be having the first live SCANF conference in a couple of years. It'll be at our home over at the JW Marriott at LA Live. Um, and we've got planning is already underway. So please plan to attend. I think on Monday you'll start hearing about it. Second thing is. Um, uh, SCAMF is part of a, a coalition of folks in the city of Los Angeles to put a citizen-driven initiative on the ballot for the city of L.A. in the fall that would raise financial resources to keep existing low-income people in their homes and to provide consistent and substantial funding for affordable housing development in the city on an ongoing basis. It's called United to House L.A. It doesn't get on the ballot unless we get 65,000 signatures by a week from Thursday. So if you're a registered voter in the city of Los Angeles and you think that funding for affordable housing is a good thing, I would encourage you to uh, think about signing the petition at the back. Um, I, think, I feel like there was a third thing. Oh, yeah. Um, on the 20th, 420, um, Wednesday, the 20th of April, uh, at 10 o'clock in the morning, uh, at Zipper Hall at the Colburn School over there across from the J, the Broad Museum, we'll be having a mayoral candidates forum, um, and it will be live. And if you're interested in attending, uh, we sent out something on our uh, listserv, but certainly if you didn't get that and you're interested in attending, you can talk to Jeanette or Blanca or me, and we'll make sure you get that information. So I hope you'll attend. Um, with that, I think we're all done, and I'm ready to start. And uh, we're going to start with Greg Kochanowski. How'd I do? Awesome. Um, this, uh, uh, we're going to have a, a great panel on, on trauma-informed design. Uh, look forward to hearing all the terrific things that the panel has to say. And again, thank you all for, for coming out today. That's a justice. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. Um, so welcome to Radical Hospitality, Research and Best Practices in Trauma-Informed Design, uh, part of SCAMP's extensive workshop and event programming. Uh, I'm Greg Kochanowski. I'm going, to try and, I'm going to try and flip this and actually keep up. There we go. Um, design principal in GGA, an architecture firm here in Los Angeles, and a board member of Community Design Group, a nonprofit organization with a mission of providing educational and outreach programming towards th design thinking in disadvantaged communities. Um, thanks so much to the California Endowment for housing us today in this beautiful environment and to my partner at GTA, Stacy Nesbitt, for being really the force behind this event today, organizing it and getting um, all these great panelists together. Um, and thank you to you for coming out in person. Um, and we look forward to a really interesting and lively discussion. Um, so there are, all these folks have uh, way more experience and expertise than I do, but I'm going to give a little summary of trauma-informed design. Uh, so what is trauma-informed design and why is it important? Trauma-informed design is about integrating principles of trauma-informed care into design and the goal of creating physical spaces that promote safety, well-being, and healing. This requires realizing how the physical environment affects identity, worth, and dignity, and how it promotes empowerment. It requires recognizing that the physical environment has an impact on attitude, mood, and behavior because there is a strong link between our psych physiological state, our emotional state, and the physical environment. It also means that intentionally designing and maintaining healing environments leads to empowerment, 
and resist re-traumatizing those who have already experienced so much trauma. This afternoon, we will explore the effects of long-term and systematic, uh, systemic trauma on individuals with an overview of trauma-informed design research and high-level findings on the development of buildings and environments focused on mental health and healing. Discovering how these trauma-informed design principles are informing the development, design, and operations of our built environment. We have an incredible multidisciplinary panel of experts here and thought leaders who each engage a different aspect of this burgeoning field of trauma-informed design. So first, here they are, and I'll introduce them all now. Laura Rossbert is Chief Operating Officer at Shopworks Architecture in Denver, Colorado. Joining the firm in 2019 after co-leading the development of a royal village in Denver, in which which created new homes, which created a new homeless shelter for women and transgender individuals, 35 units of supporting housing, 95 units of workforce housing, using trauma-informed lens in Denver, Colorado. Laura brings to Shopworks her experience as a nonprofit leader and community organizer, community engagement specialist. She is, she is using her expertise and knowledge and best practices in homeless and supportive housing to inform building design at Shopworks and find solutions to barriers to affordable housing with special attention to trauma, resiliency, and equity. Claire Latanier is an assistant professor of landscape architecture at California State Polytechnic University at Cal Poly Pomona. Uh, Claire has practiced landscape architecture since 2006 with a focus on climate resilience, equity, and public health. She translates landscape architecture and neuroscience research connecting designed environments with mental health, safety, and physical and social outcomes into actionable design strategies to create healthier, more inclusive community environments. Her book, Schools That Heal, Designed with Mental Health in Mind, was published by Island Press this year. Kelsey Madigan is the Director of Interim Housing for LA Family Housing and a licensed clinical social worker. She oversees the programmatic operations and program development of all 11 of LAFH's family and uh, individual adult interim housing sites. In total, these sites temporarily house over 1,000 people nightly. Kelsey provides consultation in best practices for design and program implementation for interim housing sites nationwide and utilizes her, and this got cut off, <laughs> utilizes her clinical background to assist agencies in implementation. Oscar Alvarado, <clears throat> excuse me, is Century's, Century Housing's Vice President of Housing Development. He has worked in affordable housing development for 15 years, overseeing um, diverse projects serving families, seniors, veterans, the homeless, and the local workforce across Southern California. Oscar has secured private and public financing for over 2,500 affordable homes. These both include construction and renovation projects as well as mixed-use projects. He oversees Century's project management and development team. In this role, Oscar will oversee relationships with key lenders, investors, contractors, and other partners working with Century to identify, finance, and construct affordable and workforce housing implementation. And lastly, Ali Barar has served as managing principal for GGA for the past 14 years. Ali's focus has been on community planning through development of mixed use, transit oriented and affordable housing, as well as long range financial planning. Ali has over 25 years of experience in the areas of affordable housing design and community planning. Prior to joining GGA, Ali was Vice President and Architectural Director of the Los Angeles Community Design Center, a nonprofit architecture planning and affordable housing development corporation that provides a broad range of services to low-income communities. Please help me welcome the panel to the meeting today. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Laura. all. It's so good to be with you today. I'm going to start my timer because I can be lengthy and we have lots of great panelists to hear from. Um, I'm so excited to be with you all today. Greetings from Denver, Colorado. Um, thanks for the heat wave. Um, so 
So I'm here to talk about a multidisciplinary team of folks that have been studying trauma-informed design for the last three years. Um, but I, I want, always want to start, this project started um, with this. I, I call this my third child. Um, so I used to run a homeless shelter, the Dolores Project, and we built a new homeless shelter, supportive housing, and workforce housing. And at the time, I was implementing trauma-informed care, which is a best practice and service provision, while we were designing this brand new building. And we started teaching the architects about trauma and the brain and trauma-informed care services and tried to do some research on how should that impact the building design. And this was nine years ago, and all we could find was how to build uh, trauma-informed design therapist offices, which is real different than people's homes. And so, um, so we decided to embark on a grand research project. Um, the research project was based on two ideas. Um, first is the idea of biophilia, which is research evidence-based that Claire is going to speak about next some. Um, and the other was trauma-informed care. And so trauma-informed care is an evidence-based program provision for folks in a variety of environments. For example, my kids in Denver Public Schools have trauma-informed care advocates. Um, in the district, um, it's a best practice in homeless service provisions, um, and really, in my opinion, in interacting with everybody on this planet, um, but I'll get to that in a minute. Um, but this was really a lot of the base of our work trying to translate this to design. Before we go any further, I think it's important if we're talking about trauma to define trauma. And so there are a variety of different types of trauma. There's kind of acute trauma, one-time events. There's chronic trauma that happens time and time again. Um, there's complex trauma, and then there's systematic trauma, right? Um, and the important thing about trauma isn't necessarily, quote, how bad the traumatic event was, but how each individual, based on their identities, their experiences in life, how their bodies and brains react to that trauma. And we don't have a lot of time, so in three and a half minutes, I'm going to talk a bit about trauma and the brain and the body, um, and I'm doing a total disservice to it, so just spoiler alert. So we're going to look at just two different areas of the brain to give a teaser on trauma and its impact on us as human beings. So first, let's talk about the amygdala. The amygdala is the alarm center in the brain. This is the thing that initiates the fight, flight, or freeze response when something bad is around us. Um, this works with the hypothalamus, which releases the stress hormone cortisol, right? So you see a bear in the woods. The amygdala is like, alert, alert, alert. Your body shifts. All of your blood focuses on the core of your body. You're focused on survival. You're not trying to decide who you think is going to win the bachelor, right? Um, then we've got the prefrontal cortex, not Cortez. I, anyway, I just saw that mistake this morning. Um, we're doing a project in Cortez, Colorado. I obviously have it on my mind. Um, so then we have the prefrontal cortex. This is responsible for emotional regulation, decision-making, interpreting emotions. So what we find... When people have trauma, the amygdala, the fight, flight, or freeze, is often hyperreactive. And it's hyperreactive sometimes decades later. And the prefrontal cortex um, does not work well enough. So what we find is when folks have experienced trauma or repeated trauma, um, they're in fight, flight, or freeze more than those who have experienced less trauma. And the braking system to calm that down isn't working as well. Your, the ability to say you're safe now um, is just different, right? So this has been studied um, in the ACE score, the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. So this was a partnership between Kaiser Permanente and the CDC in the mid-90s in Southern California. They your ACE score, um, it's just a score 0 to 10 of literally how many of the events on the screen folks experienced in childhood. Um, and they measured this and then tied it to health outcomes. 
And I want to be, I want to pause for a minute, because when we're talking about trauma, I think it's really easy to make it something for other people. But in this study, 64% of those studied in this middle-class suburb um, had an ACE score. Um, 12.5% of the population had an ACE score of four or more. So when we're talking about ACEs and trauma, this isn't about those people over there. This is about all of us and how we experience the world based on our past experiences. Um, so then they looked at health outcomes. Um, and they saw all of these correlations, um, even when you um, adapt it, um, when you control the experiment for, quote, maladaptive behavior, um, they still saw these patterns. So if you have an A score of two or more, you're four times more likely to label yourself as an alcoholic. If you have an A score of four or more, you're five times more likely to experience depression. Those who had an A score of six or higher died 20 years earlier on average. That's 12.5% of the population. So this is like significant numbers. Um, and, and I think what's interesting is for some of these, I, like, they, can, they make sense, right? Like you had a lot of trauma, you have higher rates of depression, but you had trauma and you have higher rates of heart disease and stroke and broken bones into adulthood. What is that about? Um, I really commend you to watch this incredible TED Talk from Dr. Nadine Burke Harris. She's phenomenal and really ties it all together. Um, but she gives this really haunting line when she says um, that when, especially kids are constantly in trauma, um, you know, when you're out in the woods and you see a bear and your fight, flight, or freeze shows up, like that's going to help you hopefully survive if you can run fast enough, right? But what happens when the bear comes home every single night? And that bodies and brains that are constantly in that stress have these incredible health impacts um, because blood is not flowing to the right places in your body to keep your bones safe, for example. Different pathways are being created in your brain. Um, and so to tie this all to design, um, there was this great research study. Dr. Jack Panksepp um, put the hairs of cat in the cages of mice, and the mice cowered in the other corner, right? But like, you can't reason with a mouse and say, hey, hey, dude, like, you're okay. This is just hair. It's not the actual cat, right? But even when they removed the cat hairs from the cage, the mice never returned to the same level of play. So for me, when we're thinking about trauma and trauma-informed design, this is the study that haunts me every day when I'm sitting making design decisions in affordable housing. A, am I putting any cat hairs in this building? And if so, shame on me and be hopefully getting to higher level ideals, right? How do we design spaces for healing, not stress? And we have a duty to do that. So three years ago, I headed over to ShopWorks Architecture from the nonprofit world I had always spent my days in. And we started just asking people. We're like, how do we figure out what trauma-informed design is? And so we just started asking people. So we started with three site tours and talked to 51 people. Um, now we've interviewed over 650 people with lived experience, compensated them for their time and wisdom, and brought together a ton of data. And we came up with our trauma-informed design framework that I welcome feedback on. But really what we were doing is we were looking for higher level constructs or unifying themes that spoke to broader aspects of the building that either promoted or inhibited healing for residents and staff. Um, so we have the three C's at the heart of this, which I'm gonna dive into a little more deeply. And then around that, we have the six values. These are the core values we hope design teams will use to support and guide the design process. So for example, safety. Safety isn't just, are there locks on the doors? Is it safe? It's, does it feel safe? to the folks who are gonna occupy this building? Those are two radically different questions and require radically different processes. And then we have the three contextual factors, right? The cultural context, the lived experience, the environmental context. What neighborhood is this in? What are the identities of the people who are gonna move and breathe in this space? 
what unique traumas and experiences do they bring into this space that we need to attend to in the building design so they can feel ownership in this building and experience healing. So let's dive into these three C's. So first, let's start with comfort. Um, these are things that create grounding or spark joy. We're trying to go with three C's, so you're going to have to bear with me with the comfort one, right? Um, but these are things that allow someone to be at ease or experience joy in the built design. Um, so the bottom left, this is a stairwell in a supportive housing development in Durango, Colorado. It just makes me smile every time I see it. Um, the bottom right, this is the Dolores Project. Um, there's this beautiful glass artwork as residents walk in. One resident shared, I experienced homelessness for 15 years. I walked into this building on my first day and I knew that I mattered because somebody invested in such, such a beautiful thing just for little old me. Um, for $5,000, we bought somebody dignity. Like, okay, like, let's do that, right? Um, the top left, this is a picture of the Dolores Project guests on the first night um, that they saw a tour of the shelter that they helped design. Um, but like really beautiful aspects of nature, bringing that into the space. And then top rest, left, top right, um, this is for folks exiting incarceration. It's supportive housing with Second Chance Center in Denver. But rocking chairs um, are a huge theme in our building um, and making sure nothing felt institutional. Then we have community. Community is key. Um, and this is where we have made mistakes on our buildings. I take full ownership of decisions I made that did not help build community. Um, but what we found is that amenity spaces for residents need to be within visual access of staff or they aren't utilized. And then residents don't form relationships with each other. Um, we also found things like laundry rooms are often afterthoughts um, and are super triggering, which is like so obvious when I say that laundry and trash are triggering for people exiting homelessness. Um, duh, um, but we'd always just throw together little laundry rooms wherever we could fit them. So we've shifted to doing laundry spas so people can sit in an elegant place in a nice little living room, watch TV, or we do a fitness room. They can do that while their laundry is going. Um, Bottom right is integration with neighborhoods. Um, really thinking about when folks are moving into supportive housing, how often um, one of the reasons they've experienced homelessness is due to problematic family relationships. And so they don't wanna invite them into the apartment building, into their home that doesn't feel safe. So making sure the outside of the building has spaces for people to reconnect, to build relationships um, in ways that feel safe. Um, the last one I will go into is choice, um, allowing people to engage at different levels, provide various seating, also dimmer switches on lights, blackout blinds, like I always tease the architects I work with. Um, I'm like, I know y'all design for light, but what people experiencing homelessness haven't had in a decade is dark. So you can have your big, beautiful windows, we love them, only if you give me blackout blinds alongside them, right? Um, and really just giving people opportunities of different places to sit and exist. Um, so here's our framework. Um, I'm gonna pass it off to Claire right after this slide. Um, we created our original framework thinking like maybe 100 people would care about this and the affordable housing industry kind of nationwide was like, what's next? How do we do this? And so I have a couple of publications um, that are found on our website. Um, the center one is a four-phase design process, just these are the steps in a trauma-informed design process. There's also a really geeky manual that I wrote that's like, here's the questions you ask when you're talking to residents. Here's the pre- and post-occupancy studies. This is what it looks like. Um, and then we also have an architectural principles in the service of trauma-informed design document um, as well. And then I'll give a little plug. Um, the Downtown Women's Center um, put together a supportive housing toolkit um, specifically for survivors of domestic violence. Um, so I'll put these in the back. Um, Amy, sorry she couldn't be here today, but we've done a lot of work together thinking about trauma-informed design. And this is another really great resource um, with really specific guidance and help. So thank you all. Okay, so now I'm gonna, some of what I'm gonna share with you is a, a nice reframing of what Laura just shared, but I'm gonna focus more on the context, the landscape, and the whole site. Um, so we know that 50 years of research 
supports that viewing and being in nature calms our breath, reduces stress, reduces anxiety, reduces our heart rate, and brings communities together. For instance, Roger Ulrich's 1984 hospital room study found that surgery patients who had views of trees healed faster and requested less pain medicine than patients with views of brick walls or of sky. And um, nature is especially healing for people experiencing trauma. Research shows that environments can be designed to boost the immune system, help heal trauma, reduce stress and anxiety, increase a sense of safety, bring communities together, improve environmental health, and improve climate resilience. And I'm going to show you examples of um, these kinds of environments. And I've grouped them into three overall principles just to make this easier to understand. The first principle is to nurture a sense of belonging, um, provide natureful places, and to inspire awe. So nurturing a sense of belonging. As Laura, as Laura mentioned, um, first we need to conduct an inclusive design process. And this is often not a phase included in our design contracts or in our budgets, but it's really important. Engaging current and potential residents in deep dialogue and including them in co-designing activities helps us understand the unique needs, um, cultural traditions, and opportunities available to create environments that reflect and nurture the specific communities that we're working with. And it also builds relationships that strengthen community for the long term. Next, we need to think about the entry and perimeter that we are welcoming um, new residents into. Um, we need to think about designing these communities at a scale that is both comfortable and appropriate for the surrounding context. Because from the moment a new resident enters the site, we want to convey a sense of warmth and hominess. We also need to provide a variety of spaces, as Laura said. We, we need to provide places to sit alone and also to gather with friends and also to take a stroll. Um, because what we need as people dep differs depending on who we are, what time of day it is, what, what kind of time of year it is, what life event we've just experienced. And I wanted to p share this example um, in, at Pilgrim Place in Claremont because that pathway on the left feels pretty intimate, but it's actually designed to undulate and support um, ten, 10 by 10 tents each fall when this community has their um, annual art fair. So they, they actually welcome in, in the community as well. We can design for the senses and the specific community. Um, every surface, edge, and shape that we choose in our design sends a message to residents' minds and bodies. For the beacon in Long Beach, we, we needed raised planters because the main, this main courtyard is on top of a parking structure. So we used curved plastered walls with a softened beveled edge to avoid sharp corners that seniors might bump into and that children might run into. And we, um, we made the planters along the patio edges as deep as we possibly could to try to provide residents privacy as the plants and trees began to go, grow in. And we also used native California plants like sages and grasses to provide fragrance and softness to the touch while attracting birds and butterflies, which is also restorative. We can design for all generations um, by adding elements that aren't predefined, where anyone, any age, might find something new to do with them, like this low wooden plinth that could be a bench or a place to picnic or a place to sunbathe or a place to practice jumping, as this little one has discovered. And we also need to provide places where residents can rest and recuperate. Research shows that rocking, like the rocking chairs that Laura alluded to, swinging and even walking, that rhythmic motion, brings us back into our bodies and restores a sense of calm. And we see hammock groves popping up in city parks and universities all across the country. 
Um, rocking chairs and walking paths might also be solutions because people of all ages, like the small children and to the grandmothers you see here, really find comfort in swinging and rocking, and that probably explains a lot, right? High school students hanging out at public parks, on the swings. Um, the second principle is to provide nature-filled environments. The sad truth is that even though the LA County Department of Public Health recommends a 1500 minimum buffer between freeways and major roads and places where people live or play, um, this is the kind of site highlighted in pink that so many of us are working in. This is the 105-110 interchange um, and Clifford Beers is developing a 35 unit I'm oh, sorry, 53 affordable apartments for formerly homeless households. Their design solution to try to mitigate um, the effects of this site was to this develop this concept of a living lung, a thick buffer of trees and plants irrigated by gray water from laundry and sinks to reduce air, noise, and light pollution. Um, a study from the University of Louisville's Green Heart Project found that trees can reduce air pollution by as much as 60% and improve heart health. At a larger scale, we can strengthen the sense of safety and community through design. This is a University of Illinois research project that studied the Ida B. Wells public housing community in Chicago, which is composed of 98 identical apartment buildings surrounded by varying levels of vegetation. Um, when the researchers began to study in the mid-1990s, Wells was one of the 12 poorest neighborhoods in the United States and housed about 5,700 people. When it was built in the 40s, the city had planted trees around all the buildings, but by the time of the study, many of the trees had been removed and replaced with um, concrete for maintenance reasons, leaving these alternate, alternating highly vegetated and barren courtyards. They found that residents reported being victim to half as many crimes in and around the buildings with trees compared to those without them. And they also found that 83% more people socialized in the buildings with trees than without. And that led to long-term effects in pro crime prevention because being outside with each other as neighbors formed stronger bonds and communities. We can design with nature and ecosystem services to create comfortable indoor and outdoor environments with less energy, water, and other resources. We could design buildings to use passive systems to bring in natural ventilation and natural daylight and shade south and west sides of buildings with trees. We can design the landscape so that rainwater from roofs and pavement flows into planting areas to encourage deep roots and to recharge the aquifers. And we can work with our land management teams to shift how they think about maintenance and let plants grow to their natural height and form so that wildlife can benefit from them, so that we can let leaves and grasses stay on the ground to decompose and become new soil. And this will also reduce the noise and air pollution and energy use from landscape machinery and dramatically save time and protect the health of our landscape teams. We can also plan our grounds to provide views of nature from bedrooms, living rooms, and community spaces because views, even just views through windows of nature, reduces heart rates, reduces stress and anxiety, and allows residents to engage in restful attention. We can provide residents places where they can grow their own food because the act of gardening and getting your hands in the soil is both healing, but can also give them a chance to grow and share foods that reflect their own cultures and traditions, building strength and belonging in the community. And we need to think deeply about accessibility, particularly in terms of play. Our codes and policies put hyper-focus on mobility without addressing 
the different needs of those who have developmentally developmental sensory integration or invisible physical disabilities that might benefit from a variety of textures and surfaces and the social and creative play opportunities that natural play provides. There's also a problem with the play structures like that one in the upper left that, are, that permeate parks and um, all sorts of private spaces as well because the plastic and recycled rubber safety surfacing gets dangerously hot in the sun, especially in our climate, fails to provide creative play and exploration, are toxic to both the environment and children, and far more expensive than nature-based play materials. And lastly, we need to inspire awe. Researchers for Project Awe found that awe-inspiring um, experiences like sunsets, artworks, music, or even sporting events if they're in person, and grand nature Im improve our mental health and bring, bring us together. In fact, three quarters of people surveyed said it was grand nature and natural phenomenon that bring them awe. Of course, we don't have room in the kinds of sites we're using and designing to provide grand nature, but we do have other opportunities. Most of our sites look something more like this, the Fullerton Heights community in Fullerton, which was placed in this very industrial neighborhood after the residential neighborhoods they were trying to um, build in refused them. They, we tried to make the most of the site. This is an on-podium project, and that driveway on the right is over the parking structure. So you see this thin sliver of trees around the south and western edges to try to provide green views. We also used that bottom right corner to provide an, a natural play area, and the designers put um, the community garden on the roof of one of the structures. We can provide um, wall space or floor space or ceiling space for art and murals that speak to the communities we're working with and um, reflect them. And we can also find micro moments in nature, like this little bird bath my son put together out, right outside my window during the pandemic. In moments of stress or anxiety, the smallest Examples like this can become places and moments and to hold on to, anchors, to ground us to the place where we are. And this allows us to develop an attachment to the place where we are that improves our mental health, improves our sense of community, and improves our sense of belonging. These three principles nurture a sense of belonging, provide nature-filled places, and inspire awe, can help us design environments that nourish and nurture our communities and give people places for respite and places to be whole. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Kelsey to talk about services. Hi everyone, thank you for having me today and thank you for all my panelists as well for supporting this process. Um, I first wanted to talk about the kind of participants that we serve and kind of what the barriers they are experiencing in our sites. So I'm gonna use the words participants and residents kind of interchangeably. Residents refer to our, uh, the participant, the people who are in our permanent supportive housing sites and participants refer to our participants that are in our interim housing or kind of like our shelter sites. So our participants and our residents, they experience a lot of co-occurring disorders. So some of those may look like substance use barriers, physical health barriers, mental health barriers, and sometimes DV barriers all together. So a lot of our participants are already experiencing these traumas. We can also argue that anyone who's experienced homelessness is experiencing trauma or has experienced trauma. We can understand that a night on the street, even if it's just one or if it's just two or if it's one week of experiencing homelessness, on the street, that is a traumatic experience in itself. So this kind of shows the common types of barriers experienced by unhoused participants, the type of site design and concept that manages the barrier, and then lastly, the service delivery that manages the barrier. So when we're talking about 
common experiences that participants or residents have when they're experiencing homelessness. This can look like physical and sexual trauma. So getting beaten up on the street, getting sexually assaulted on the street. And unfortunately, a lot of our participants and residents experience this often. So what does that look like in a site design? Offices and meeting spaces separate from sleeping areas. So when we have service staff that come to the site, um, they are not visiting the participant inside of their bed area or in their dorm area. They have a space to meet with them without walking directly through their, the place that they're living. Also, what does it look like for services? So what do we have on site to support this? We have DD resources on site. We do safety planning on site all the time with our participants. Um, staff diversity is really important to be representative of the population served. So not just gender, race, and sexuality, but also having lived experience is really important. Reflecting the age of the participants and residents is really important as well. Some common mental health diagnoses for our participants who have experienced homelessness um, can be psychosis-related disorders, so like schizophrenia um, and things like that, depression, mood disorders, and other trauma-related disorders, and of course, adjustment-related disorders as well. So what helps them in a site design? Natural light is really important when we're thinking about skylights and things like that. If participants have the option to have that vitamin D inside of a space when they're extremely depressed, they don't want to leave the site, maybe they're agoraphobic and they're really nervous about getting out into the community, skylights and lighting is really important to have that option inside of the site. Um, having natural points of engagement is really important as well. So at some of our permanent supportive housing buildings, um, at each level, we have glass offices, so our, um, our staff can engage directly with the participant as they're going up into their unit. Um, Semi-private sleeping pods is also something awesome as well, where participants are rolling over in their sleeping area, they don't see the person that's next to them. So they have some level of privacy, while we're also able to monitor the site appropriately as staff. We also, in our newer sites, we've added support animal design elements, which has been really cool. We do pet housing in, we did pet housing at one of our sites called the Willows. So participants who are going to the doctor or going to their job or going to their therapist appointment and they can't bring their two super excited cats or their three birds or their two great Danes or whatever it is, they can leave them at our site um, in a locked area that we can monitor. It also helps participants really feel safe in leaving the site. So if you think about people, participants, residents with animals, sometimes they might get really nervous that someone's gonna take their companion animal. Someone's gonna leave with it, walk outside with it, and they'll never see that animal again. So we want to provide those locked spaces so people feel safe um, leaving the site. Also, fitness rooms, of course, are very important when you're thinking about increasing endorphins, especially for people who are experiencing depression. Um, and outdoor exercise space is awesome as well. Community gardens are important, not just for staff, but also for participants so we can engage in activities together. And then what does this look like for service delivery? So at all of our sites, we have on-site mental health support with LA Family Housing in general. So we have clinical services teams that connect participants to the Department of Mental Health. We do counseling on site. We do light touch therapy um, on site as well. And then we also do crisis intervention all day long for whatever the day may bring us. Um, psychoeducation, crisis intervention, like I previously discussed, community resources and support. We always make sure that we have all of the resources in our community that we can access. Um, in any place that we build a site. So that includes animal shelters, our DMH offices, our health clinics, community centers, and things like that. Um, and then, of course, exercise and wellness programming as well. A lot of our participants also have attachment to personal items. So when they're on the street, sometimes their items have gotten stolen several times. Things that were really important to them um, were taken from them. So we have to make sure that when we're when we are creating a site, we have adequate amount of storage space for participant items. Not just storage space, but locked storage space for the participants to store their items. It's very, very important. Um, and then also at our sites, we have safe boxes as well. Um, we know that some participants, because of the trauma that they've experienced, they carry weapons with them, and we don't want that to come into our site. 
some participants are struggling with substance use and not sober yet. So we allow them to keep some of those items in safe boxes outside of the site, kind of like amnesty boxes, but we don't take out whatever's in those. We allow the participant to keep their items outside of the site so they can access them as necessary, but making sure that they're not inside of our, inside of our site. Um, so service delivery for attachment to personal items, hoarding training is so important and our clinical teams do it all the time with our participants and with our staff. Um, assistance with um, organization, so helping participants and residents fold their items, get organization bins and things like that are very important. Um, substance use. So as we're thinking about designing a sleeping dorm, um, knowing that participants often use who might not have access to a safe place to use, we started creating models that had dorms where uh, participants were able to sleep in pod-like areas so we can easily monitor if someone's not using inside of their, of their dorm. We do staff walks every hour to monitor that and make sure that we're responding appropriately. This really assisted us with our harm reduction strategies including all of our staff being able to administer naloxone, which overturns opiate overdoses. In the past two years, we've overturn overturned over 25 at just our interim housing sites. So this, this, this really allows us to have good um, visual visualization over the entire site. Um, needle exchange programs and also partnerships with inpatient programs and ability to, um, to hold beds. And these are some of our outdoor or indoor spaces. I'm gonna go through a case example of a participant who may need to be meeting in a specific type of space. So if you think about the participants that we serve or the residents that are in our sites that we're designing for, we have a lot of people who are maybe experiencing psychosis. So they are maybe really upset at their another participant. They feel like someone's following them. They feel like the person that's following them is following them through the dorms. They don't feel safe meeting inside in an office. Where do you meet with them? We have to give them choice and options of where to meet. So we can meet with them outside. We can meet with them inside an office. We can meet with them in one of our little um, areas that are our lounges that are inside of the site. Um, but it's very important to create different types of spaces to meet with a participant who's experiencing some type of um, uh, crisis at the moment. And as you can see, I'll go through these pictures super quickly, but we have like yoga areas, little lounges all throughout our sites, community spaces for participants to hang out in, um, private offices. And if you notice, a lot of our office spaces and our spaces in general have glass doors. This is also trauma informed for our participants and our staff. So we know who's walking up into our office. We know who's behind that door. We know when somebody's coming. And then these are more pictures kind of about the pods. Um, you can see there's private space, but it's still very easy to monitor. And then farthest to the left are our, um, some of our little cat dorms that we have. And then second picture from the left is our couples, um, couples dorms. Being a trauma-informed agency, it's, uh, we really want to make sure that we understand the importance to participants of physical touch or in a relationship. So we decided to um, add couples dorm, a couples dorm to our latest site, our newest site. And then also don't forget about the staff. So what about staff spaces? We want to create private spaces for staff to take breaks, to take their lunch, to have a breather after they had a really you know, difficult interaction with a participant or heard a really difficult story from a participant. Staff experience secondary trauma a lot. And it's really important that we have spaces for them to just decompress. A couple of these items include um, regular offices that are on a different level of the building sometimes a uh, little staff area outside, somewhere to meet with their other coworkers in a courtyard type of area. Um, so those things are really important for our staff as well. So when we're thinking about spaces, we want to not only think about the participants, but also think about the needs and the trauma and the experience of the people who serve them as well. And with that, I will pass it off to Oscar.
Thank you, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Oscar Alvarado with Century Housing, and I wanted to talk to you all a little bit from a developer's perspective and share some ideas with you about how we might incorporate some of the um, ideas that you've heard today into your projects and your project planning um, within your organizations. Um, I want to start by sharing with, with folks maybe something that's very obvious, but you really want to consider values when you're choosing your design partner. Not all architecture and design firms are created equal. And it's important to just note that uh, everyone plays a part in creating these really complex living environments that we're all trying to uh, create for our residents to thrive in. So whether you're talking about landscape architecture, engineers, interior designers, who you select really matters. Um, we want to, I want to encourage everyone to make the most of the expertise that you have in-house from your resident services team from your property team, um, whether that's people who work for your organization, your housing development organization, or their third party that you contract with, it's really important that we create opportunities for uh, regular and meaningful engagement among all different um, areas of expertise. And then um, I want to talk to you guys a little bit, um, give you guys some examples from our projects of ways that you can commit to design elements that you feel contribute most to resident well-being and figure out ways that you can replicate those across your projects. So um, for Century, our biggest learning laboratory over the last 20 years has been our Century Villages at Cabrillo community in West Long Beach, which is a 27-acre community where we house over 1,500 people, 650 or so of whom are veterans. This has really allowed us to, to think about the way we deliver housing, both from a building level perspective and also from a neighborhood perspective. So incorporating things like walking paths, uh, occupational therapy, opportunities through grad students, um, connectivity to transit. These are all the types of things that, that we've been able to incorporate into Century Villages. And um, the key here is collaboration. We have over 30 partners that provide services on this campus. 12 of whom have an actual physical presence there. And Century's uh, role has been as that of a backbone organization. And by that, what I mean is that we convene all of these partners um, to create goals uh, for resident outcomes and to work towards those together. And then we, as a backbone organization, work to fill in the gaps in services wherever they may be whether that is through you know, our own staff or whether it's through helping our partners build capacity. So just to show a little bit about a couple of the projects that we have at Century Villages, this is Anchor Place, which is a 120 unit project that we placed in service in 2017. It's 120 homes for formerly homeless individuals, veterans, and small families. And one of the things that I wanted to, one of the reasons I like this picture why I wanted to show this is it shows um, a bit about the hierarchy of exterior uses. At the forefront of the picture, you see kind of a community common walking path. And pushed to the front of that walking path, you see shared community amenities. There's a fitness room, a yoga studio, and a larger community-wide um, community room that are clearly uh, accessible to the wider community by the way that they're placed. But then if you look back, more inward towards the building. There are different levels and tiers of places that you can be at the higher levels of, um, of uh, exterior, exterior spaces, and that creates kind of an opportunity for choice for residents. They have the opportunity to uh, build community both within the building that they live in and also the broader community in a way that feels comfortable to them. So there's sort of this hierarchy of private and public spaces. Um, Similar idea here with our Cabrillo Gateway project at Century Villages. You see the same idea of hierarchy of exterior uses. Drilling down a little bit more detail, I wanted to show um, this site plan of the first floor of a project called the Cove, which is the sixth phase of development that we have at Century Villages. It's a 90-unit project for uh, formerly homeless veterans um, that will hopefully break ground in a couple of weeks here. And I wanted to share a little bit about some of the spaces that we have here. Starting uh, at the top in gray, we have a suite for service provision and resident services staff. That is kind of a agglomeration of, of uh, 
offices that are put there together. We also have a space for the VA to have its service coordinators. This is a VASH supported project and we will have VA staff on site. So we wanna bring them into the fold of service provision, make them a part of the services suite. In orange, we have the property staff and uh, property staff is near the services staff, but purpose purposefully slightly away as well. A lot of times when you have residents, some of what they may want to talk about with their case manager may have to do with issues that they're having with property management, issues of rent collection, issues of uh, housekeeping, things of this nature. So you wanna create some privacy and you don't wanna make it hard for residents to feel like they can go and see their case manager. Um, we talked a little bit, Dr. Kelsey talked a little bit about not forgetting the staff. In yellow there, I don't have an arrow pointing to it, but that's a kitchen and a lounge for staff. We've got some, uh, a kitchen there and so a place, place to sit. So this is a place where, where um, staff can go and have lunch. And we found this to be really important in our master plan communities especially. It's, it's a little difficult to put an amenity like this in every single infill development. But here at Century Villages, we have between all the organizations who provide services, there are over 200 people working on site. And so scattering these across the community becomes really important and becomes a very important sort of respite for our uh, services staff and property staff. So going on from that, pointing to the community room in uh, blue there, the community rooms, we typically lay them out in our supportive housing buildings as one large space that is clearly open, but also somewhat seg segmented into different uses. It provides open and clear lines of vision, lots of choices in activity, lots of choices in the way that the space could be arranged. But you can see you can be doing various kinds of activities in here, whether you're just lounging, watching TV. At the far right, that's a pool table. So whether you're, you're playing games or what have you, or gathering around the kitchen, it's one big open space with various uses, lots of choice, very comfortable. Some of the same principles that we've been talking about um, throughout the presentation. So to hone in a little bit more on one of these amenities, we'll talk about the kitchen, because this is something that we found to be key as we're designing our, our spaces. Um, like I said, our kitchens are located within a larger community space that's sort of large enough to hold uh, building-wide events. The cooktops for the kitchen are created um, and placed in a central island that looks outward and is designed for teaching, gathering. This is pretty important because a lot of the, um, the residents that, that, we, that we house are uh, taking parenting classes, life skills classes. We have a lot of parents that are formerly homeless that are looking to reconnect with their children. So there's a lot of really important activity and learning that happens around these spaces. And then you just have your typical community building beyond that, right? Like social events, holiday parties, and just hanging out. So these spaces, this type of a kitchen layout really works well for us. There's four examples here from four different projects of, of how we, we've done that. So going back to the idea that I shared in the beginning about finding the things that work well for your organization and then figuring out ways to replicate them. Um, Similar idea here, this is our Beacon Point project in downtown Long Beach, and what we really wanted to highlight here is a double height entry lobby. This is another type of feature that we like to replicate in our, in our projects. It really creates a sense of arrival um, to a building and lets you know that, that your home is something, some place special. We, we make it look very residential and attractive with the finishes. It's just kind of a great, a great welcome home, and this is one other, one other um, amenity that we like to replicate throughout our projects. Um, and just talking a little bit more about how we work internally within our teams, there's obviously a lot of challenges, right? Like we're all working together towards the goal of creating great places for our residents to heal, um, beautiful environments for our residents, but we come at work from different lenses when you're talking about property staff or resident services staff, development staff. So some of the challenges that you'll often see is that there's a perception of maybe asset management or property management advocating for the building. They're there to advocate for the asset, whereas resident services staff are naturally advocating for the person. And there is a push-pull, kind of a, a natural tension within that, that we're always um, 
working on and working with in our developments. Um, as a developer, uh, it can be hard to bring your services team and your property team into thinking about the future because they are very focused in their work on what's happening right now. What is the resident crisis that I have to deal with in this moment? What does this building need from me in this moment? So pulling staff away from that and having them sit with you as the developer and think through a project in the building that won't even go into construction for another year and a half and won't even have people living in it for another three years can be a really big challenge. Um, and so really for, for us, what we found is that the crux of things is to create opportunities for meaningful and shared learning across your, your housing organization. And so I'll leave you guys with um, one tool that we use to that effect, and that's what we call our quarterly milestone meetings. And these are meetings that we hold every quarter in our office uh, where the project manager for a project presents on their project at various stages. And the stages that we bring projects to these meetings are listed here, one through five in the slide, starting from the very beginning, from project concept. And what we do is we have the project manager present to the rest of the team on their project, and it creates an opportunity for everybody in all functional areas of the housing organization, you know, compliance, maintenance, property, asset management, uh, development, residential services, we're all sitting in the same room going through uh, individual projects at the stages that they are. And it really gives every team member a voice and an opportunity to, to speak from their area of expertise. <clears throat> and maybe even more important than that, I think it creates a sense of responsibility um, and accountability across all team members for the fact that we are all jointly responsible for creating great places for people to live and for doing that and thinking through that from the very beginning of a project. Um, probably important to say that these are not typically kumbaya moments that are all, you know, uh, lovey-dovey. There's some very difficult conversations that need to be had. There's obviously limits to resources, limits to what you can do and place in every building. And these are places for hard conversations, difficult conversations to happen, but Ultimately, we feel like um, this process really assures that our best practices that we've learned along the way are replicated and that uh, we can continuously refine on those, on all the projects that we have um, moving into the future. So I'll leave you all with that and pass it on to Holly. Thank you, Oscar, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, my name is Ali Bahar. I'm a um, principal with GGA. Um, starting off, we just a little bit of a recap here from um, Laura. We talked about the three C's of trauma-informed design, community, choice, and comfort, and then talked a little bit more about the framework of trauma-informed design notions of connection, joy, and empowerment, and safety. We also heard about um, the, uh, the design principles with trauma uh, in mind from, from Claire, nurturing belonging, um, providing nature-full places, and inspiring awe. And, um, and also um, the trauma-informed system of care that I, was, I think I was, uh, was mentioned throughout the conversation relating to issues um, such as safety, choice, and empowerment again. And I want to talk a little bit about how some of these themes um, sort of translate themselves in our work, in our design work, in our thinking. Um, and uh, the sort of first of all, starting with the notion of belonging um, and the sense of community, the sense of connection that ties into issues of um, safety like it was mentioned earlier. A sense of freeness um, that, again, touches on concepts of joy, choice, empowerment. Motion, and motion not only about um, how one moves through a project, through a space, connecting with people, connecting with places, but also um, connecting with motion that um, nature provides, you know, 
a cloud floating by or the fluttering of tree leaves. And, and the notion of privacy, safety, and peace of mind, a place of prospect, a place of refuge. Um, we all need community, but we also all need the, the ability to be able to be self-reflective and, and safe. And, um, and again, as um, Claire mentioned, um, natureful spaces, really sort of creating opportunities for us to continuously be enriched by, um, through our senses by experiencing nature and experiencing the environment around us. And enjoying a sense of awe and seeing things that are inspiring, seeing things that are serendipitous and unexpected that lift the spirit. Um, there's a, um, these are all sort of themes that we applied to a project that we actually recently worked with Oscar, our, our firm worked together on it. Um, this is, a, um, this is a, a, a supportive housing project. It's a model that moves away from the sort of the traditional um, approach of um, having it be an illness focused sort of um, support and care to one that is much more of a wraparound and a whole person um, approach. And it's been proven to have um, positive impacts in sort of behavioral, psychological, and health outcomes. Uh, the project is um, a, about 300 units of permanent supportive housing. And it has a, a component of a peer res respite program. It's a 12-bed peer respite program. This is a, um, a transitional housing for a temporary uh, level of high care for those who are not necessarily re ready for independent housing. And a 6,000 square foot um, workforce development um, that um, essentially, as you all know, provides um, employment, um, employment training. But um, it, there is through a, through a cafe that is located at the ground floor of the building and activating, um, activating the plaza for the building. The tenant population that is um, targeted here um, are persons with mental illness, um, with co-occurring co physical disability or um, substance abuse um, disorder, and um, adults and other um, transitional age youth um, who have severe uh, mental illness um, disorder issues and are at risk of um, homelessness. The, the project is near um, Lincoln Park area um, um, of uh, LA. It's a, in a very um, dynamic neighborhood. There's quite a bit going on between Lincoln Park, between the piggy backyard and other institutions in the neighborhood. It is, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a community of really sort of varying character, varying scale, but one that is really full of potential for, for, for growth. Um, and the, um, our approach to really sort of making the project a place for people, a place that um, engages the context, engages the history, engages the culture of the place, and the, the drive for the project really to be uh, one that creates um, equitable places and um, that improve um, connection and connectivity amongst people and places but uh, that all, uh, mostly um, is one that is really authentic about um, placemaking in our city and in our community. The basic uh, model for us when we started was really sort of the basic principle was a full integration of landscape and architecture and looking at an urban model that is um, essentially a courtyard building that addresses the, the surrounding streets in a straight way but then looking at how this form can be inflected so that it responds to the context, it responds to the environment around it, but it creates places that prioritize connection, that prioritize social, socialization and landscape. And looking at ways to um, adjust the, the, the form still to provide even more connections to the um, to the environment around, to nature, and to landscape for all of the residents of the building. 
this is this sort of essentially sort of guided us to an approach where the architecture becomes um, a framework. It's one that uh, really it's about sort of creating these multi multi use spaces that have um, a lot of different um, functions. You see a few of them here having to do with uh, a courtyard, a drop off courtyard, and a multimodal um, space. Um, uh, a recreational space, basketball court, roof terraces with community gardens and central courtyards of different scale, providing a whole um, variety of uh, and variety and scale of um, open spaces for the residents to engage with. Speaking of connectivity, this notion of porches and loggias were um, very important to the project. In LA, as we know, shade on a day like this is uh, superbly important. Um, so how can we sort of um, leverage, leverage that, leverage the notion of porch and the transparency of porch to really sort of start creating these connections internally and externally with the community? Where there, an example of it here is at the mouth of the building, connecting the, the, the building to the street, um, an underside of the, uh, the building, a loggia of the building, providing um, this kind of a transitional space that provides, again, a variety of this different scale, a variety of transparency to see the programs around it and what, how one would like to engage with it. The idea, again, here is to provide not only diversity in spaces, but opportunities of choice, going back to notions of empowerment that allows the individual to essentially examine the environment they're about to enter and make decisions as to how they want to engage it and whether or not they want to engage it. Same idea is um, carried up through the building and sort of not only looking at possibilities of um, bringing vegetation and gardens and landscape to the upper levels and making this available to, the, to all the residents, but also creating um, these gallery spaces where off of the corridors create, um, create a variety of spaces where people can come together um, on occasions and bump into each other and have um, have a way to sort of reinforce their community and also giving us an opportunity to maybe use that as, um, as, a, as, uh, as a way of providing um, public art and reinforcing the placemaking aspect of this. We heard earlier today about the, the, glass, um, the glass screen and the glass sculpture that was in the lobby and how the tenant reacted to it. And this is yet another example of that same approach of making sure that the places that are made are, um, are used to re restore and reinstate people's dignity and a sense of place and sense of themselves. Here's another example of that. You can see both the sort of the porch spaces <coughs> underneath the building and the elevated um, galleries and gardens. When you lift up the building, this is the floor plan of the building. This is the site plan of the building. You can essentially see that um, it's, a, it's an urban garden. It's um, the, the idea of integrating landscape with architecture uh, was, was the driver for this. And uh, the notion that the, the experience of the building should be one of essentially walking through, through a garden in a continuous vegetated space that offers a variety of different spaces, different scales, again, allowing for control, empowerment, refuge, connectivity. So each of these spaces can have that same variety of purpose and same variety of engagement. And when you look at this, where the building lifted up, you can see that that same garden is now anchored by a series of um, program spaces, supportive spaces, really creating this place of well-being and full support and engaged with nature and community. And with that, I'm going to turn this back to my friend Greg, who is going to take us through the questions. Thank you for your attention.
<laughs> anyway, because of my throat. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so we do have a mic back here somewhere. So I'd like to see if there are any questions from the audience. Um, first, thank you so much to the panel for a very informative presentation. Um, we do have one back here. Are there any questions? There's one in the back corner. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so one of the things we saw was um, using glass for offices. So I'm just curious, how do you balance the privacy of the people that are having whatever it is, their, their counseling session, and the safety and the reasons that you explained for having glass offices? Yeah, a lot of our, can you hear me? A lot of our offices are glass, but they have shades that we can pull down for privacy. Um, we leave them open so we can engage with participants or see them as they walk by. Um, but we do have shades that also protect the participants' privacy when we're meeting with them. That's it. One for Laura? Yes. So you mentioned something about the trauma with the laundry rooms. Mm -hmm. Can you elaborate more on that? Because I work with several projects in which we focus on <laughs> separating the laundry rooms and sometimes making sure that um, certain vents are covered so individuals can't get to them. Yeah. Uh, so what you showed was the complete <laughs> opposite. So yep. I'm kind of curious about how that yeah, so that really came out of our research of talking to folks. Um, and what we learned often was um, that people who are moving into supportive housing and have experienced homelessness, um, it's really traumatic for them to put their clothes in a washer and walk away. And so we would have these small laundry rooms, and they would literally sit in this tiny little room that was often an afterthought. Um, for like two hours while their laundry was going. Um, and so acknowledging kind of trash and laundry as triggering environments, um, we sought to shift that. Um, and what we found in the laundry spas is we haven't had issues with things getting harmed because they're not just sitting there bored for like two hours not doing anything. They can like read a book or have a conversation with a friend or watch a show. Um, and so then they're able to be close to their laundry, but, um, but not have to just like stare at it in this like dark little room with maybe a window door if we Okay, so it was more it. like they were afraid that someone would steal it. Okay, yep. I was curious about that. Okay, yeah. and my second question is for Claire Manscaped. I've seen several projects in which there's elevated planters, and I've seen projects where there's more lawn. And I've noticed afterwards, when I'm doing the punch walks and meeting the people, that the open lawn space is what they prefer because they can actually lay down, take a nap on the grass, in which a lot of projects prefer, prefer to have planters elevated with benches. And people enjoy the planters, but they don't get to use the landscape. So have you seen that be more where it's the case where people prefer Elevator planners over like areas that they can sleep or rest in? I think, I mean, what I think why we see the elevated planters is because so many of our projects are on structure. But we, I have seen um, projects where even on a structure you can have a, a gently slope up to a lawn that is more usable. And I will say that um, research I've seen with younger children, lawn space, providing lawn space in Southern California where we have so few, so many of our young people don't have access to that, don't have parks, is really helpful for developing core strength because it allows people of all ages to practice get it, just getting down on the ground and getting back up is actually a skill that is necessary as we get older. As I get older, I realize how hard it is. I'm <laughs> off the beach, and you know, and I'm pulling my 84-year-old mother like desperately to get up off the sand. It's a really hard skill to learn if you don't have those opportunities. So, and it is a favorite, I think, for all of us. Um, it usually has to be balanced really well with water use. So, being able to use gray water, for instance, and subsurface irrigation. 
or choosing species and really being careful with watering schedule. I'll say that we overwater lawns to the point where they only have roots this big. So if you can get really um, brainy with your landscape team to water once a week deeply instead of every day, like so many irrigation schedules are just automatically programmed to, you can grow taller lawns that require less water, that are more resilient and softer and all of that, have more benefits. And then the other thing I'll say about that is like no chemicals, like be, be less picky about having a perfect lawn. So many of our, what we consider a, our weeds are actually really beneficial to soil and pollinators and, you know, dandelions are a, a delicacy. So why are we killing them all the time? Well, thank you. Appreciate it. Hi all, thanks for that presentation, it's really helpful. I guess I have a question about working internally with your teams like asset management, property management. I think a lot of the great ideas that you all bring up are often um, kind of shot down internally, right? I think a lot of what they're looking for is the most ease in terms of management, like they don't want to have to manage your spaces or, you know, um, kind of the values that we're holding around dignity and choice, I think are often, um, less of a priority for them, right? So I guess my question is around um, just your experiences and what kind of works internally with the team, um, with these values, and also around safety. I think one thing that comes up a lot, especially in kind of these different spaces that we're trying to create for people, is that then, um, you know, our departments want everything, there has to be cameras everywhere, right? There has to be all sorts of these different things that I think are sort of at odds with some of the values that you all are trying to bring up in trauma-informed design. So, yeah, th that's my question. Maybe I can say a little bit about working internally with your, with your teams. I think this idea that, that I shared about the milestone meetings really came from, um, it's borrowed, first of all, from our friends at MidPan up in, in, uh, in the Bay Area. It's, it's something that um, a, friend, a friend of mine and a, and a colleague uh, shared with me that they do there. And it really came out of, out of this need that we had to really sit down and have meaningful conversations around what we were developing and get everybody to get on the same page about the fact that we all have a responsibility for these spaces that we're creating. It's not just a development thing until the day that you turn the building over to, to property and resident services, right? Like we all have a stake in it from the beginning. And I think the, the charge really has to come from the top and, and, and um, you really have to have leadership that, that says this is, this is what's important. This is all of our responsibility and everyone is, is accountable. And that's really the only way to implement um, processes like, like this, you know? And they are hard. I mean, these, these spaces, like I said, I said so, somewhat jokingly, but they're not, they're spaces where difficult conversations have to happen. Sometimes the conversation is as much about what you are going to do with the project and within the project and what you cannot, you know, afford to do or, you know, don't have the space to do and those things. So it's, it's you know, good to have those conversations early and have them often. And I think um, as a, to add to that as well, I'm a social worker, right? And I wasn't at the table for a lot of these conversations in the beginning, but really having a multidisciplinary team approach to get buy-in at every single point of the project from the beginning is super important. So if you, you have a social worker that's giving the feedback for the internal staff while we're designing the building, that really uh, changes the way that the development and the design goes from beginning to end, and that really helps implement um, safety for staff, having staff voices in there, and um, supporting the participants as well. And I'll add, I also think we sometimes overlook the training and conversations on the front end of a project, and it makes everything hard for the next five to 20 years. Um, and so a lot of my job is like training developers and training property managers on trauma-informed care and trauma-informed design. And once people understand the why, they're more likely to go along with it. 
Um, so I've seen that be incredibly helpful. Um, we also, as a part of our trauma-informed design process, we write these reports. So like I'm editing one right now for Bayad Enterprises in Colorado that's building housing. And it's a 23-page report about what we heard of what's working and what's not working in the building and design implications for that. And instead of just like sharing that with leadership, I'm, I always ask, can I share this with all staff? I want everybody to hear how this design thing um, makes the participants in the program feel. And I think if you have those conversations with folks like property management who are often just left out of it and have really hard jobs, um, it means that we're just like, no, we're doing it this way, and then they feel totally disempowered. Um, so I try to get to the why and the values because we all share the value of wanting people to have a beautiful, dignified place to live that is safe for everybody. Um, and if we can start there, then it's about bringing the team along, but it's a lot of work to do that. Um, good afternoon, thank you for your presentation. Uh, this is for the LA Housing. Yes, so with um, Housing First, uh, we all know that uh, regardless of your uh, desire for sobriety, you're offered housing. So how does it work, really, if you house people who are committed to sobriety next door or even across the way from people who are not who have not made that commitment? How does that work? Do you house people together that way? Yeah, and the truth is it's very difficult. Yeah. It's difficult to have those conversations with our sites we have a ton of different types of interim housing sites. Mm -hmm. So we have um, sites that have 47 rooms and there's like four to 10 people in each room with a bathroom in the room. So it's easier to break up people in that way where we're like, all of these people in this room are sober and we're trying to keep it that way. All of these people in this room have to work, are going to work every day and we want to make sure that we're matching people based on need. Mm -hmm. It becomes a little more difficult when we have these really congregate dorm types of sites but in the building design, we created several different uh, dorms, so we're able to move people around based on that experience as well. Um, that's also why we have clinical teams on site, so we can openly dialogue and talk about the difficulties of being in a site when other people are using, mm -hmm. um, and also talking a little bit about the safe boxes, because we we did that for weapons and also for substances, because we know that people use, we realized that once we started really taking um, the, tr uh, the harm reduction model into account and started adding services, being really realistic about what people are experiencing, especially with substances, and adding more services to store substances, to talk about substances, to connect to Suboxone and Methadone clinics, people are more open in coming to our team to talk about it. And that piece has helped our entire community, especially the people who are trying to stay sober, feel safe in that environment. Just creating a space to talk about, hey, I'm not sober, and I don't know what to do. I need help. That, um, that helps the entire community. And do you feel that there is a minimum bed size in order to separate the two groups? Because there are a lot of smaller providers out there that don't have the luxury of a 200 unit, 100 unit, even 60 unit or bed um, location, smaller service providers don't have that luxury. What, what would you say to that? I would say it's less about the closeness of where the participant sleeps, but mm -hmm. how they engage around right. participants in the entire site. So if you're sleeping next to someone who is doing meth in their bed, that is not allowed on site, right? So targeting the person who's doing meth in their bed and finding a safe place for them to use mm -hmm. and targeting it that way, to us, the 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 closeness of the bed is just one part of it, um, but there's like a million other things that we can do to support the both participants who are staying sober or are still deciding to use. Great, thank you. And then about the glass door, so is this tempered glass? Do you find, um, have you ever had a door broken? Not in offices, no. Okay, and then what is the average length of stay uh, in your building? Yeah, so we, the goal is that we house everybody in 90 days, and obviously we know with the LA housing market that's not possible. Um, so we have participants there as long as they're engaged in their housing plan. Um, so the average length of stay for our participants in interim housing is around uh, 12 months. 
Great. And I think we had another question over here yeah, as well. She's raised her hand. Um, hi, my name is Nancy. So I just want to say thank you for all the knowledge and information you shared with us. Um, at LTC, we're actually working currently on a few projects that are in the pipeline that are going to break ground soon. So we're in the community planning process. So a lot of your ideas I really want to bring to the conversation because I think it would be great for our community and, and the residents uh, that, that are going to be living there in the near future. Uh, but my question is around services. Um, so do you guys implement services under the uh, Housing First model where it's uh, completely optional, and if so, what is the approach that is taken for folks that do not want to engage in services that just kind of want a place to live, and you know, what what's the approach or the conversation there? Yeah, so I think about it as like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and we learned this in like social work. So if you look at the bottom the bottom level of this like triangle, the foundation is eating and sleeping. Like, where am I going to sleep? What am I going to eat? All the other things, like mental health care, your physical health needs, job, all of that stuff is not a necessity if you don't have that, the, the foundation of where to sleep, what you're going to eat. So we truly believe in the Housing First model, and we are not uh, the only exception or the only uh, requirement to get into a housing site would be that they're experiencing homelessness. Um, so that has been really helpful for us. We are also a housing program. So if a participant is not engaging in housing, we give them several opportunities to engage. We do whatever it takes and try every different type of model to engage them in housing. If they're not engaging in housing, then we would exit them from that particular program, engage them on the street until they're ready to engage in housing, to open that bed up and that space up for someone who's ready to engage in housing. And as it relates to services, this is where like the building design and the program folks need to be having lots of deep conversations. So how you design the building allows staff to like check in on folks who might not want to like come to a case management meeting, right? Fair housing, you can't require them to. Um, but really think about how the staff offices have eyesight sometimes on the front door or there's always a staff person at the front desk. So if you're like, hey, I haven't seen Carla for three days, let's just go knock on our door and bring her some cookies. Um, we also do things like laundry machines. We do ones that use tokens. The tokens are free for residents, but you have to come to a staff person to get one. You can get laundry pots, but you have to come to the front desk and ask for it. Um, put the mail room within eyesight of the front desk. So that's like a place that everybody goes to check their mail. So really think about kind of what, and like food, everybody, like Maslow's hierarchy, like just offer people food. Like they will show up. And it's through that kind of trusted relationship that you're here just to be helpful and to give them food and laundry pods and tokens and a bus pass when they need it. Through those kind of casual interactions, then they'll realize like this person is actually legit here to help me and their brain can be retrained to maybe trust this one person. And it might take like two years, um, but it's through a lot of like small interactions of trust, that that trust can be built, that then f we see folks engaging in case management down the line. Um, but you can't expect everybody to walk in day one and be like, what is my case management appointment, right? Like, no. Um, but it's kind of those slow peeling back of authority figures who've done these people wrong their entire freaking lives. So you can't expect them to walk in and trust you. Like, I'm really nice, that, that doesn't matter, right? So I need to prove it to you. Um, but you can also force those interactions in the building design and the programs. All right, we are unfortunately out of time. Um, would offer you the opportunity to come up and speak with folks uh, on sidebar. Um, First of all, I uh, hope you will uh, join me in expressing our appreciation for the panel and the speakers today. Uh, secondly, thank you to yourselves for showing up today. Way to go. Um, we will make um, the presentation available uh, afterward. Um, and so look for that. You'll also get a, uh, an opportunity to give us feedback on the session, um, so for, look for that. Um, and then, uh, uh, you know, the plug again, that we got the mayoral uh, forum on the 4th, uh, the 20th of uh, April, so a couple weeks from last Wednesday. Um, the SCAMP conference on the 27th to 28th of October. And if you're a registered voter 
in the city of Los Angeles and you care about affordable housing, there's a petition back there uh, for you to sign to get it on the ballot in the fall. Um, the very second to last thing is that if you got a badge and you want to stick it in that basket on the way out, it helps us recycle those and save a little bit of money. And then finally, I hope you continue to stay safe, and thank you so much for showing up today.